them being the faces of the park, I mean, every emergency that happens, people just go to the kiosk because they know that someone's there. So they're going to report, hey, grandma fell down. They're going to come to the kiosk. Uh, they're going to have a problem with their site. They go to the kiosk. You in the kiosk are kind of like the brain of the park is how I put it. And from there, all the directions go about. And that's where I come in a lot of times is when there are situations that you can't handle or that are dangerous to handle, that's where I step in. Um, we have a ton of great volunteers in the park and I brought some volunteer brochures with me in case anyone's interested in volunteering. Uh, the primary volunteers that we have in this area are camp hosts, which generally make up of people who, are of, who have retired and want to give back to the public in some way or another. They stay in the park, usually in their personal RV or trailer, and they serve basically the kiosk, helping the kiosk workers figure out what's going on in the park. So whereas the kiosk can't leave the park, the, or can't leave the kiosk, the, the camp hosts do and they go around they come back and they can run messages for you or whatever. The unique thing about working as a park aide is that there's actually upward movement involved with it and the upward movement is the fun part in that we have three senior park aide positions that we have assigned to our park and the senior park aide gets a lot more responsibility and a substantial pay raise over the starting salary of a uh, seasonal park aide. Senior park aides we have work for us generally year round. They're going to be driving state, uh, they have their own state vehicle. Um, they oversee the other park aides and they assist the rangers in just about anything you can imagine from processing the mundane things like processing paperwork to fun things like working with projects, coming out, helping trail, trail days, helping swing the, the hammer, organize those events, and also helping out with the interpretation aspect, which is my personal favorite aspect of the job, which is going around and just teaching people about the park, giving them that sense of ownership, and giving back to the public. Trust me, no, nothing's more rewarding than when you have a school group of third graders come in and they get really excited over something they've never seen before. I've had kids who have lived in Santa Maria and have not been to the beach. And when they come, you know, it's this opportunity, like the first time they see a sea anemone, you know, we, we all take that for granted, but when you've never seen something like that before, it's pretty fascinating. So to be able to, to contribute to that, be, a, be able to be a part of that, which the senior park aid position does allow you to fill that role, it's something special. And with me being the coordinator of the park aids at our local parks here, I can tell you that I worked as a student and I didn't have anything handed to me and I had to, you know, I had to pay for my rent, I had to pay for my groceries, I had to balance my job with school, which is difficult. And so I know what it means to have a job and a boss, essentially, who is school friendly. And that's exactly what we are at the state parks and that we work around our student schedules. There's no question about that. School comes first for me and the opportunity to work as a park aide I see it as an opportunity for you in building your resume. Because park aides, from this position, even if you did not want to do anything in state government, you have just about any career covered. Because you're going to have cash handling skills, to teaching people, to handling aggressive visitors. I mean, what doesn't that apply to? It's truly the catch-all position. Um, before I move on, do I have any questions about that particular aspect of it, our seasonal positions and what's available right now? Yes? Is there a minimum age and also is there a, um, what's the salary range? Start? So the, <laughs> the minimum age is 16. So, and then they have to have a, a parent or guardian's permission to work. Um, anything over that though, we accept. The only thing that we really require the position, because it is an entry level position, so if you come up to me and say, I have no job experience whatsoever, that's fine. This is where you start. You got to start somewhere, right? And we train you on everything. Um, to answer your next question, it actually varies for whoever is starting, because it depends on how much education you have. There's a lot of state differentials. 
it usually falls between the 950 range and the $11 an hour range. It, it depends what you're doing. Senior park aides can make the same thing based off the differential. They can make anywhere from 11 to about $15 an hour. Um, the longer you work with us, the more your pay increases. Every year you get a pay increase and that exists for every state position as long as you don't have anything detracting like if you don't get written up for doing anything. Only time you get written up for doing anything is if you did something blatantly wrong which you knew about. You know, no one gets written up for example for having a cash register come back, you know, eight dollars short. It happens. When you process five thousand people in one day, eight dollars is pretty good. Right? Any other questions about that before I move on? Yeah. How many positions are available, would you say? So right now, I have about five or six positions left. And I brought applications with me. People are welcome to grab them uh, when I'm done. So I know that Carpinteria State Beach, which is its own sector, it's different from us. It's fairly close here. You guys are about the halfway point in between Carp State Beach and us. Carpinteria is hiring as well. So you could look into that if positions filled up with us. Um, I know that our maintenance park aid positions where if you're someone where you like to be outside a little more and handle stuff or you see yourself going into some sort of outdoor construction field, you know, a, a lot of jobs need that as a precursor. That's a good one to go into as well. So you can still grab an application for that. It's the same application, turn into me and I can turn it back to our maintenance people and pass it down that road. Any questions about the positions that we have available before I move on to what I do? Sure. What do you often look for in applicants? What was that? What do you often look for in applicants? I, you know, I, I really just look for eagerness and um, I'll give you, I like real world examples. So I, I held uh, applications the other day and this guy came in, not well dressed, um, you know, kind of a slack jaw attitude his hat tip sideways and just telling me that he needed a job for the money. Right? I mean that's obviously a no-go. Same time the guy right after him was the exact opposite. Came in, shirt, tie, dress slacks, told, he flat out told me, he's like, I do not have any job experience. I did this internship. I'm really eager. I'm willing to learn. All, I'm punctual and you know, I want to be what you want me to be. The right attitude's everything, and first impressions are also everything. So like I said, I'm not looking for you to come up and say, hey, I handled a register for five years and I you know, never miscounted a bill. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking also for people skills, because this is a job where you have to be prepared to talk to everyone all the time about everything nonstop. And you also know how to be tactful, so when you have people that come up and they're like, hey, yeah, what's the tide today? Yeah, are there any seals out there? And you're watching your line go bigger and bigger, and they're like, yeah, so what did, how did you get in this job? How did you get started? You gotta be able to say, oh, that's great, sir. You know, if you wanna talk, there's our 20 minute lot right there. You can park and I'll chat with you when I'm free, but I gotta handle all these other people. You know, you gotta have that skill. And that's at, at least the, the basic skills in that. And this is a great job to build that. Like, uh, we had one person who I just hired He's a real shy guy. He told me right from the start, he's like, I don't want to be shy anymore. I want to talk to people and I want to know how to talk to people. I said, great, hop in. Well, you know, after your first shift, you'll be, you'll be good to go. You know, you're either going to make it or not. So if you have those people skills, it's definitely a great job because you do get to talk to a lot of interesting people and people generally when they're at their best, which is when they're on vacation. So any questions? Yes. There are longer term. I was going to go into those in just a moment. And also wondering, do you have connections with like the Los Padres National Corps or like anywhere in the backcountry? We do not. So we are a state agency and they're a federal agency. And there are areas where the two intertwine and work together. However, we do not have any connection with the local Los Padres National Forest. We, we, I have a connection to the forest. Oh, I'm going to bring you up. You don't get to just walk in here. Come here. Yeah. Are the Channel Islands connected to to us? Are those wardens or 
Yeah, are they park rangers? Then? So the Channel Islands, that's a, actually a really good question. So conflicting jurisdictions out there. The Channel Islands are a national park, so they do have national park rangers, which are the law enforcement aspect out there. They also have all the other type of rangers. Let me just clear something up, because this, this gets really confusing with people. Rangers, by California law, can only be peace officers meaning what you see before you right now. Like, I am full state police. It doesn't matter if you're in the park or on the 101 or right here right now. If I see something, I do something about it. Um, the other ranger under California law is the type that you see in your local county or city, which is the, they do walk around, they, but they can only like write parking tickets in their own park. But they're still technically peace officers. You get the federal level, there's no distinction as that, which is why the National Park Service calls everyone who works for them a ranger. It gets really confusing, trust me, especially when people come into our park expecting the same system and it's t entirely different than the federal. So when I'm using that term out there, they have all the different rangers in the federal parks. They also have the state wardens. Something a lot of people don't know about the, our state wardens are they are also federal agents. So whereas they work for the state agency, the federal government has given them the blessing to enforce federal law as well where appropriate. So they do both out there. So you'll see the wardens on their boat. Um, I think it's called the Blackfin, the one that you see out at the harbor here. And the wardens are a bunch of really great guys and that's another career that you could think of if you're looking for a natural resource career in my line of work, there is only the rangers and the wardens for the law enforcement to protect the resources of California. So, but we do two very different things. Sometimes there's overlap, and I'll get in that when I talk about my job. Uh, did I have another question before? So this fellow right here, this is Tommy. He is a SBCC student, and he is one of, he's practically my right hand. He's a senior park aide with us. You want to say anything about the the job, just what your take is on it and your view as a student? Well, I view uh, being a senior park aide as a great stepping stone to the law enforcement ranger aspect of state parks. Um, I'm really interested in uh, resource management and just parks and national parks itself. So, Do you like your job? I love my job. <laughs> it's a uh, great public interaction. It's Personally, I feel like I'm more confident speaking in front of people. Uh, right now, I'm a little bit tired, so that's why I'm kind of uh, my breath out a little bit. But anyway, besides that, uh, I get to talk to people every single day. I get to see people on their best behavior, uh, not best behavior, but happiest moments. So sometimes they're on their best behavior. Yeah. On that note, let me torture you for one last second. A common misconception of working in a resource agency or working somewhere like a park, like if you do have a career or you're looking for a career in law enforcement, people think police department, sheriff, right, CHP. They don't really think of us right off the bat. Let me ask you, the, the first ride along you went along with me, did you have any idea that we would run into stuff that we ran into? There was a lot of things I didn't think that you did. So? Well, there were like that you enforce and that uh, state park rangers actually do. So, my when I first started with state parks, I thought the, a park ranger was like something you see on Yogi Bear, or when you go to the when you go to Yosemite or something like that. Guy that gives uh, nature walks, and you still do occasionally, but there's a lot more to it. Yeah. Than what I was expecting. All right, I've tortured you enough. All right. <laughs> so, um, if you want, if you want to stand. Um, I want to segue into what my day-to-day -day looks like because as you brought up, we are we do have long-term options available. Like we are hiring rangers and lifeguards right now, permanent rangers and lifeguards. We are set to do five more academies after this current academy, which means that you're looking at depends what intervals they go, but academy should be running for the next five years. State parks runs its own post academy. All rangers and lifeguards are post certified, which means that's the peace officer standards of training. That means that it's the same type of academy you go to if you're a highway patrol, if you're a sheriff, if you're a policeman. The only difference is our academy is a little longer because it tags on about a month's worth of resource training. And yeah, so those opportunities are available. 
And not just if you don't have any interest in law enforcement, there are a lot of careers that you can springboard from from the park aid. We have environmental scientists. Um, on Friday, I'm teaming up with one of our environmental scientists driving down the Ventura River and doing bird counts because there's a lot of federally endangered birds that use the estuary right there. Uh, we have land surveyors, we have office techs, we have digital designers. So even if, if you're an arts major and you think, well, what career do I have for me in state parks? We need graphic designers. We need people to design our, our interpretation panels, our brochures, our websites. We're a department that does just about everything. So like, who's someone in this audience who has a career, or a career in mind or a major in mind that they don't think really applies to parks? I'm just curious. Let me see if I can r prove you wrong. Well, I mean, I've worked in like IT for a long time. I desperately you know, like rely on our IT people. Like, I, I literally spend probably two hours on the phone with them every week. It's like the printer's not working. I need to report, or I need to print out this report and get it done. Our IT people are some of the most valuable people our department has because the internet and the intranet, we have an intranet for our own department. It's like the mini internet just inside the organization. It's, it's the blood. It's the capillaries. It's, it goes to everywhere and it's how all the messages are sent and delivers everything. Without it, without our IT people, they're like the white blood cells. If they weren't there fixing everything, it'd all get bungled up and we'd all have a heart attack. Uh, anyone else have a uh, Oddball career choice or something? Music. Music. Yeah. That one's actually pretty easy because we we develop all of our own themes for our promotional videos and documentaries and everything like that. You need scores. Um, we have a ton of historic parks that require someone with a musician's background because a lot of our like for example, um, anyone been to Hearst Castle up the road off the one? Yeah. So Hearst Castle every year puts on a big history day where they go back and they try to throw a raging party like Hearst used to throw in those days. Who do you think are the people that come and play? I think they're paid by just anyone? They're not volunteering, I'll give you that hint. So anyone else, any other job? That one's a good one though, that one's a little trickier. Yeah. Physics major working for you? Physics major? If it comes down to surveying land or applying anything of that sort, any sort of mathematics, we have people that do that. And we have a whole segment in the department that does nothing but crunch numbers, figures things out, builds stuff. I mean, you name it. We are, in fact, probably our biggest use right now is that we're becoming ADA compliant, which is the America with Disabilities Act. Um, it's That's something that you really got to be able to sit down and crunch numbers when you're talking about what is going to be the slope of this trail? What are we looking at? This building, this ramp, you know, if, I mean, if you want to tackle those problems, they're there and they need people, so. What about culinary arts? Culinary, I always get that one. And it's always, uh, that one's always pretty easy because there are a ton of state facilities. Like we have the Asilomar, anyone been to Monterey? How about Pacific Grove in particular? Okay, so if you ever go to Silmar State Beach, you should. It's gorgeous. We also have the Silmar Conference Grounds, which State Parks runs. It's this giant, beautiful conference ground, and it has a giant dining hall. And they come up with menus, and they put breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and dessert on every day. Every, every day of the year, that dining hall is open and running, and they need a coordinator there. And that's just one example. There's a few other dining halls that we have across the state. So it's there. You know, there's the obvious stuff and there's the there's the little niches that you got to figure out where you could fit in. But um, one of the cool things about starting with us as a park aide with whatever job you decide to do is that your state service starts the second you became a park aide. And this is something that's really big. And I'm going to use Tommy as an example. How long have you been working for us, Tommy? Two years. Two years. That's and two years. how much longer do you have in college? About two more years. About two more years. And then give or take, waiting if you get into academy, like a year, right? So five years, let's say, by the time he gets into, because you still, you still want to be a ranger, right? Okay. So five years until he gets into a ranger academy. 
Well, when he comes to retire, way in the future, his five years as a park aide are going to count to his career. So that means right now, with my retirement, I'm going to work probably about 30 years or so and retire, I don't know, 52, let's say. When I'm 52, which is pretty solid for being able to retire at 52 with almost 100% of my salary. You know, and if I work longer, I get even more of my salary, which is nice. Tommy, if he were me and, and if I had his state service, he would be able to retire at 47 even though five of those years were not as a ranger or whatever he ends up becoming. Five of those years were at a park aid seasonal position, just working in the kiosk, getting paid the entry wage. But when he retires, those five years are going to be counting towards his ending salary, meaning that if he promotes the superintendent and makes $120,000 a year, those five years will add to his retirement and they'll count. That's something you don't find in the private sector. And it's something that, in my guess, will be gone in 15 or 20 years from now. So while it exists, while you can get into the field and get locked into it, it's a good career move. Because I'm looking forward to retiring and spending a good 20 years doing whatever I want, traveling around. And don't get me wrong, it's not, it's not all flowers and butterflies. It, it's not an easy job either. I have hard, hard days. I have seen dead people. I have been there when people have died. I have pulled my gun on people time and time again, and you don't know whether you're going to have to shoot them or not, and you hope to God that you never do. And that takes a certain toll on you. So it's not, it's not like a free ride, but it is one of the perks of the job. And I know that's kind of a heavy moment, but I want to use it to talk a little more about what I do as a ranger of state parks and what my day-to-day -day is. Um, so the great thing about being a ranger is your job is entirely different depending upon where you are. If you are assigned to the North Coast Redwoods at you know, John Doe Redwood State Park, it's probably going to be a quiet little corner and you're going to be focusing more on education, resource management, and you might write three or four tickets in a month for something. You might get a big arrest and that you get the burl poachers, which are the people that go and carve a, you know, 300-year-old burl out of a redwood to try to sell. Has anyone seen that the, those news articles lately? It's when the yeah, it's one of the newest ways for people who have drug problems to feed their addiction is you just go get a chainsaw, carve a burl out of a, you know, 4,000-year-old tree, and there you go. You get a few hundred dollars. So there's that aspect. You can work for one of our OHV parks as a ranger that stands for Off-Highway Vehicle. There's some, the local one is uh, Oceano Dunes. Has anyone been there? Anyone know what I'm talking about? So that's where people go, ride around on the dunes. Um, there you're going to be a cop probably 99 percent of your time it's a f fun cop job because you're riding quads and everything else chasing down people but it's also boom 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 that's all you do um, i like where i work along the gaviota coast because i get to do everything the state beaches are busy enough that what i do on a day-to-day -day is mostly law enforcement but they also have the breaths of fresh air, which is the resource management, which is managing our trails program for Gaviota, managing our volunteers. Um, the great thing about the job is it, it's whatever you make it. When I show up to work, I have a few functional assignments, things that I have to get done, but no one is telling me when to do it and how to do it. And no one's telling me that I can't take on extra projects. And, if I have any character flaw, it's that I probably take on too many projects at one time because it's, it's fun. And that's one of the interesting things about the job is you enjoy going to work. I'm excited to go to work because on Friday I get to do that bird count. You know, the next day, it, who knows what I'm going to do. I might have a trail program to run, lead some volunteers. 
I might go out on the 101 and get some DUI drivers and pull them off the road. It, it's whatever I make it. Um, that can also be the greatest problem about the job is if you don't have the discipline to, to set your schedule right, it, it can be difficult because you just don't know which way to go. So if you're someone that you like that open horizon, you like being able to say, start up your patrol truck and say, where am I going to drive today? What am I going to check? What am I going to do? It's totally the job for you. Um, resource management in the parks, that's where, that's the background I come from as a zoologist. And that's the way as a ranger you have to look at the law enforcement aspect. And it, what, it's what draws me in an entirely different category from the sheriff, the highway patrolman, and the policeman. So those guys are going call to call. They don't really pick what they do. You know, they get a call from dispatch going, you got a domestic violence corner at the corner cliff and, you know, Cabrillo. It's like, Burp. then you go over there, right? When you're done with that, you have another thing, you know, brother fighting his brother down on East Beach and alcohol involved, blah, blah, blah. You go do that. With the Rangers, we're one of the last proactive law enforcement agencies. It doesn't mean that we don't react to calls. We do get calls. That's why I have this on and you know I have a dispatch center and I hear people talking right now but the greatest thing is is that you can go out and you can find the problem and stop the problem and we have the philosophy as rangers in that if you take care of the little things you don't get the big things and a, a perfect example of that is um, I'm trying to think there's actually many perfect examples of that you have, I'll, I'll, here's a real, real life example. We had an incident about a year ago where there's some people chucking rocks at a sign at one of our trailheads, right? It's damaging the sign. Went over, wrote the guys a ticket for vandalism, kicked them out of the park. Same guys came back about a month later and started doing the, the same thing. One of our guys saw him, didn't do anything about it, decided it wasn't a major issue for whatever reason. And the next day, all this construction equipment that was there in lockers was broken into. Now, I'm not saying for sure it was the guy throwing rocks, but you get where I'm going with this? Let's say it was. Let's say these guys we had a bad impression about when we ran them the first time. They came back with long criminal histories, burglary included. I mean, I'm just drawing the line. So had they been talked to that time, maybe the construction equipment wouldn't have been broken into. The same philosophy applies to campgrounds. Campgrounds are a very interesting thing that, that I have to run and manage. And people see minor stuff like, oh, well, you know, that kid's drinking underage. It, in the grand scheme of things, some, you know, a 19-year-old drinking a can of beer in a campsite, the world's not going to end, right, if no one catches it. However, let's up that to 6, and let's have them stay up to 3 a.m. while five other campers around them are trying to sleep. Problem, right? So you go in right off the bat, write tickets, kick them out, tow cars, whatever you need to do. Then you don't have that problem later. Then I don't get called at 3 a.m. from my house having to put on my gear and go solve this issue. It's something in law enforcement that's called broken window theory. And the basic premise of it is, let's say you have a giant warehouse and someone chucks a rock at one of the windows, right, and breaks the window. No one fixes that window. What do you think the likelihood is of someone going and chucking another rock at that window, right? And pretty soon you have three quarters of the windows out. Someone decides to come up and tag the building, because obviously no one cares about the building. Now it's tagged. Now more taggings come. Next thing you know, the street light goes out. No one cares about it, doesn't fix it. And now you have drug deals occurring by the building because it's obvious to criminals. No one cares about this. No one's watching this. So we apply that philosophy to parks. And it's a very interesting aspect of my job in taking that from a street cop sort of perspective and applying it to the resources. And when I talk about the resources, I'm talking about the physical trees in the park 
the animals. We have federally endangered species. We have cultural areas that are sensitive. Is anyone here of Native American heritage? Okay, so we have a ton of Chumash sites just along this coast. I'm the only person that watches them. One of my biggest arrests last year was three guys who were out there digging in a Chumash graveyard, robbing the grave sites, right? You don't read about this on the news. It's, a, it's out there and it's happening. And this is where I come in as a proactive law enforcement officer. No one called that in. You know how I got them? I was hunting them. I was looking for it. I'm out there in the bushes late at night with night vision goggles watching because I saw something that caught my eye and I went and I got them all red-handed. That's the kind of impact that you can have with this career. And moving away from the law enforcement aspect of it, the other thing I love doing, the tide pool walks, fantastic. Campfire programs, fantastic. Junior Rangers, if you had a hard day as a sheriff, let's say you're a sheriff, and you saw you had three domestic violence arrests in one day, which isn't uncommon for them. So you've gone you've seen three broken homes, three broken families, and then the next day you go and do it again. The difference is with a career in state parks, I might do that one day, because domestic violence, people don't leave it at home. It comes on vacation with them, right? So I might deal with that and been, been like, man, that was rough. You know, go home, come back to work the next day. But then I have junior rangers. I spend two hours with a bunch of kids who are crawling all over rocks, you know, and like, what's this called? A flower, a flower, you know. It's, it, it's a totally different gear change and the fact that I have that ability to de-stress that way and to, to go down that road and be able to partake in that, it's huge. And it's what I think makes a big distinction between my job and any other law enforcement in the state. And finally getting into the resources themselves, it is fun if it's your forte, you know, go out, sit, count, or set up wildlife cameras, count how many mountain lions walked by it in, you know, a month period, try to figure out the population dynamics, send that to your environmental scientists. They crunch the numbers, you see the results, you see, hey, mountain lion populations are up in the park. That's great. Well, probably not if you're a hiker, right? But it's great and it's fun to do all that and I'm only scratching the surface about just the diversity of things that I do so I kinda want to open it up to you guys right now and just any questions about state parks about what I do about what career opportunities we have I really wanna just answer them so really if you have anything throw it at me just to clarify I'm sure you mentioned it earlier you have how many positions five to six yes for the park aid position Carpenteria should have some as well, and if you do turn in an application to me and I, for whatever reason, have filled up, I can always forward it to them because I know all of them. Um, what's the education required for a job like yours? Good question. So it is an incredibly competitive field to get into one of the Ranger Academies. I believe that there were 21,000 applicants for when they flew mine and they picked 30. So, but off of that same list, they ran three more academies and you have to look at who's applying to because one of the biggest things for applying to a ranger position is since you are a peace officer, you have to go through a criminal background check. And, you know, I, I know people that, I mean, hey, me, myself, I'm human. When I was in college, did things that I regretted. You know, people get speeding tickets. People are people. You will error. That's never what they look for in a background investigation. What they're looking for is one, are you lying? And that's the biggest thing. That's the biggest washout of people is if they lie. The other thing is, you know, if you're someone that has a history of domestic violence, you're not going to be a peace officer. They don't care if you, if you have a, a few speeding tickets or something like that. Everyone does, right? Who doesn't have a speeding ticket in this room? Well, me too, okay. So I guess that's a poor example, but a lot of people do, right? It's a common thing. So I guess if you guys want, I can talk about the 
whole process to becoming a ranger because it is kind of a confusing issue. But you guys want to hear that? Yeah. Okay. So it's not a slow process. And actually, I do want to answer the education requirement yeah. real quick. Yeah, like two years degree, four year degree. It's about two years worth of college, but to be two years worth of units. And but to be competitive, you should have your four year degree. In my class, there is only one guy who didn't have his bachelor. There's also the incentive to get your, your bachelor because um, you do get paid more every month if you have it. And it does have to be relatively pertinent to the position. So they do like a lot of natural resource things. So like, like I said, mine was zoology, so it was science related. But if you are anything, like you can be a math major. Math is required in just about any single job. Parks and rec majors are the majority of people. Uh, forestry service majors, so I think the only college that does that in California is Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. I'm not positive. Those aren't required, but those are what I have seen. I, I know plenty of guys, though, who are rangers who are business majors. And they fell into the business or position, and guess what? Their business skills come in handy because when I get, when I'm looking at my budget to see how many park aides I can hire, I'm looking at an Excel document, and I'm like, okay, I don't understand this. Get one of the guys that's that had the business major. He's like, oh, okay, here, let me. Oh, okay, so you can hire this many. Oh, cool, thanks, man. You know, our our strength is our diversity, so. That is one of the greatest things about the job is that no no ranger, you'll never find a ranger that's exactly like another ranger. And like I said, that's one of our strengths. I, I'm, the, I'm the science nerd in my group of guys. So if they come to me and like, hey, what's this? Purple sage. Is it native? Yes, it's everywhere, man. Look at the hills. You know, It's obvious to me, but it may not be to them. Same thing when I look at the Excel document and they don't understand. <laughs> or I don't understand, and they do. So uh, the process to becoming a ranger, though, like getting any position with state government, and like I said, this is the specific process to a ranger, but it will aspects of it are similar for about any state position you want to go for. One, it doesn't happen overnight. It's the government. So the the file that you or the application you fill out gets sent to someone who evaluates it, who gets sent to someone who evaluates their evaluation, and then it gets sent to the evaluator who evaluates their evaluation, then it gets sent to processing, and then the people that process the process stuff. <laughs> Welcome to bureaucracy, ladies and gentlemen. That is unfortunately how it works. Because of that, the hiring process takes, the fastest is around a year. Slowest that I've seen is three or four years. And mine, I heard, was the fastest academy hired at about a year. So I applied when I was in my last quarter at UCSB, and I was hired the following winter, which is pretty good. It is a, it is a bit of an obstacle, obstacle course getting there. You have to actually apply for the position. So they flew the position right now online, and they have the directions and how to follow. You fill out the same application that you would be filling out for a parkade. You send it in. They respond with a test date. They have test centers all over the state, so it doesn't matter where you are. I took mine in El Segundo down by LAX. And you go to this big room, and you take this I'm not going to lie, it's a completely arbitrary test, right? There are some park-related questions on it. The hardest part I had was the math because they don't let you use calculators, and I'm definitely not a mathematician. But it's, one of, it, it's what I call a common sense test, and that's really what it's testing for. If you have common sense, you will pass that test, and that's its main purpose. Once you get beyond that point, you have to uh, do a physical agility test, which is not very easy. It, it is for some people, but for your average fitness level, you do need to train for it. Um, there's a step test where you go up and down on the step for like five minutes. It sounds really easy at first, and it is as you're doing this, but by like minute four and five, 
that Steph is like, you have to run around a track with full gear. Anyone doesn't know I'm wearing a Kevlar vest right now. So you have to run around with that. You know, this is probably, I don't know, about 30 pounds around my waist right now. Walk around with this every day. So there's a reason why you need to take this test. Suspect runs from you, you gotta be able to catch him wearing all this. You're the one at the disadvantage because they, they got a head start and you're carrying weights on you. So there's good reason for that test. After you pass the physical agility test, they have you do an oral interview, which is actually the most important part of the selection process. So the oral interview, you go in, I did my Ventura, they again have interview centers, and you sit down and there's a panel of three people. There's usually one, at least a ranger on the interview panel. They'll have someone for, from our administration, like a timekeeper or someone like that, a human resources person. And then they will have an oddball from select any field in the department they be there. It might be environmental scientist, it might be a maintenance worker, it might be the superintendent of all the parks himself, right? You never know. And they ask you a series of, of questions and you have to answer them appropriately. And what they're looking for are key buzzwords and again, common sense. Some of the questions, um, I'm actually not allowed to say what any of the questions are, but I can give you an example of, of one. It would be something like, you're at, I don't know, El Capitan State Beach and you have fencing up around a sensitive dune habitat area with signs everywhere saying, do not cross fragile ecosystem. And there's a mother and her son collecting sand crabs in there. What do you do? Now, I mean, you guys are looking at me right now with, what, what do you mean, what do you do? Do you, do you do you go up and write him a ticket? Do you go up and talk to him? And, and that's a, a good example of a question. So what I would say is something like that is, I go up and I call him out of the enclosure and you know, I'd see what their disposition is, see, okay, they did in fact see the signs or no, they didn't see the signs and they were sorry, they came in through the back way and they got lost track chasing sand crabs and then you, you know, but okay, well then I'd educate them on why that area is important, why we need to protect it, and then I tell them where they can collect sand crabs. You know, that's an example of the type of question they might ask on one end. Another question they might ask is something as terrifying as you get a call that there's a, a camp or there's a fight at campsite 57. You arrive on scene, there's a man with a butcher's knife stabbing his wife. What do you do? Believe it or not, there's a million different answers to that. And, you know, if you're considering what I'm wearing, do you shoot him? Are you going to hit the wife as well? You know, I mean, these, these are some of the questions that they ask. And the oral interview is one of the toughest interviews you have to do because of that. You, you will get that broad range of questions from sand crabs to man stabbing his wife. Um, the other thing that they always throw into an oral interview is some sort of surprise presentation that you have to do for one minute. So something like, they'll just tell you, okay, uh, for this next question, actually you are going to give me a presentation about recreational activities in this park. They like give you a brochure, you look it over for, you know, they give you three or four minutes and then you have to give a presentation as if you were talking to a troop of Cub Scouts about what opportunities they might have in, you know, Molasses State Park. So, it, the oral interview goes a little bit of everywhere. The interesting thing about it is it determines your class ranking, which means that I got rank one, which means I got 100% on my oral interview, which means that when I got in the academy, I was ranked first in my class. And what that means is that when they come out with the list of what parks you could go to and start out at, I got first pick. Why do you think I'm in Santa Barbara? <laughs> All right. So after the oral interview, you go on to your background investigation. Um, it's, 
it's it's pretty intense. They they assign an actual background investigator to you and you spill your, the beans about anything you've ever done ever, every parking ticket that's ever been written to you, every time you said a hateful word to a, a ex-girlfriend, you know. It all gets laid out on the table. They look at it all, they call people. My background investigator, he didn't call my roommates. He didn't call my neighbors. He called every ex-girlfriend I had since I was 16 and asked them what kind of person I was. When he told, he, first he told me I, I passed and then he told me that that's what he did. And I'm like, how did I pass, <laughs> right? They're ex-girlfriends for a reason. So that every background investigator has their own style. So they're, you know, some of them do. They call all your roommates from college ever. You know, hey, is it true that he, he smoked weed, you know, three times a week for three years straight? Yeah, it's true. You know, or the other guy, no, it's not true. You know, that's, they, they will ask that kind of question. And if you're honest, generally you're okay. I, I know a guy who, he didn't end up being a ranger, he ended up becoming a sheriff with a county I'm not gonna mention, but he had a DUI in his background investigation. It was from like 10 years prior, he got hired because he didn't lie about it how could you lie about that? But lying is, is the killer in the background investigation. Um, after that, they give you a, um, a psych test. And the psych test is probably, you will feel crazy after you take the psych test. Because it asks you questions like, you maybe have not once felt at some point that you did not have a feeling about a certain thing at one time. And you just look at it, you're like, uh, you, yes? You know? But then it'll ask basic stuff like, do you hate your dad? No. You know, you go through this, and it is not a short test. It is a long test. And I think in some sort of sick, twisted way that they are trying to make you crazy while you take the test and that clinging to your sanity is what makes you pass the test. Because after they, you turn in your test, you go and meet with an actual psychiatrist who determines whether you're crazy or not. And that is quite an experience because you basically sit in this room with this guy and they go through your test questions. And you know, I remember one of mine when they're like, Mr. Patterson, I see here that you said that you may or may not have once had an experience that was surreal at one time that you didn't have a negative feeling about and then you decided it was not. And then you answered, yes, I did. I'm like, and I just looked at the guy and said, honestly, I had no idea what that question was asking. And I, I, I thought I was saying this. And they would also ask you a bunch of weird stuff like, hey, do you love your mom? Yeah, I love my mom. Oh, okay. Does your dad love your mom? Yeah, dad loves mom. Dad ever hit mom? No. Dad ever hit you? No. It's like, you know, at the time I had a girlfriend when I got hiring. You know, do you love your girlfriend? Yeah, I love my girlfriend. Then why do you beat her? I don't beat her. You know, I mean, it is, it, it is weird. And I, I don't understand the ways of a psychiatrist, but it's there. And <laughs> this is actually a good story. You guys will like this one. One of the questions that they asked me about that actually kind of made sense was they said that I answered yes to I sometimes see things that other people don't. So from the psychiatrist, perspective, he saw me as looking at a sort of like eight foot tall rabbit next to me right now, like Donnie Darko status that you're right, that no, no one else can see. From my perspective, I had to explain to him, I'm saying, no, 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 no. I said, what I meant by that is because of my education in native plants and like what bird is what, I see things that people don't. Like I can see a functioning ecosystem one part, I can see a sick ecosystem, I can listen to a tree and identify every bird species in it when someone is just like, there's a bunch of birds in that tree. I'm like, that's what I meant by that. I, and I had to explain to the guy, I don't mean that I, like, I, I see things that don't exist. I see things that do exist that other people do not perceive. So once you get through all that, they give you your conditional offer of employment and they tell you when the academy is and you show up to the academy and for seven months of your life you don't have a life 
and you do a lot of push-ups and you do a lot of test taking. Believe it or not, you go to a police academy and there are a lot of tests that you take and you don't, you can't really be stupid. And I hate to use that word, but that's, that's the word. You can't, the, the tests are designed to have intelligent people pass them. So if, if everyone here is in college, you're all intelligent people, you could all pass the test but you have to study for them. They're not easy. I found school easy for me. I had to study for these tests. Like you get to the search and seizure laws there and you have to study for that, that post exam, man, the book is like that thick. And then you have to go through all current case law. And that's stuff you gotta know. And it's not just arbitrary. I have to know search and seizure laws every day that I'm out in my job. Cause you know, if I come up right now to you and I open up your backpack without asking you, I have violated your civil rights. And that's a big deal. That means you can sue me for, viol and not, not the department, you can sue me. You can take my house and my car. It's a lot of things that people don't tell you about, you know, when you're watching all the stuff on TV lately and, and people throw out a lot of allegations at police that they, it, it's, heavily used these days that someone's civil rights were violated. It's not very common amongst people in my profession because we all like our houses and our cars and it's really easy to have them ripped away from you. But for example, if I ask you like, hey man, do you mind if I look in your backpack? And you say yes, free game. Or let's say there's a little baggie of weed and I could see it sticking out, free game. Doesn't matter what you say. So that's, that's a, a distinction that you have to know. Um, case law changes all the time. That's something you constantly study in a post academy is the Supreme Court is always putting out new decisions and some of them are in law enforcement's favor, some of them are not. And I don't like to view it that way. I like to say what's in society's favor because if something comes out supposedly against law enforcement, well it's not necessarily against law enforcement, it's just whatever it was doing was not constitutional before and the Supreme Court finally determined that. So here we are, but yeah. Uh, I think we should finish up pretty soon. Gotcha. It's, it's, um, 30, but, um, yeah, Thank you. I can talk yeah. forever. It's, <laughs> it's one of the, uh, it's one of these jobs where if, you, and that, actually, that's a, a good way to, to end it, is if there's anything you learn coming out of the academy and you have to pass FTO, which is the field training, which means you have a veteran officer assigned to you and you go out and you do everything and they get you into as much, as much stuff as possible so that at the end of your training, uh, you are a solo incompetent peace officer meaning you step on out in the world by yourself and that you know your first day by yourself is a scary day. It is. It was also a lot of fun, but the one thing that I would say about this, if you are looking to go down the, the aspect of being a ranger, is your greatest tool is not, it's not anywhere on me. It's not, it's not assigned to me. My greatest tool is this and this. The fact that you look at some, we all know this, you look at some people that you know and the way they talk to people, it's degrading, right? Or they ramp them up or whatever. Some cops are the same and those are not very good cops. Good cops are people like, I like to hope that, that I am, where I don't have any major use of force that I've had in the past three years, despite being in a lot of nasty situations, including a Ponga takedown that occurred along our coast here. I was the second person on the beach with my shotgun out, pointing at drug cartel members. With this, I've been able to defuse a lot of situations, prevent a lot of people from needlessly going to jail or needlessly being hurt. If you can talk to someone, hey man, I don't want to hurt you, I'm not trying to harass you, I am just writing you a ticket for having your dog on the beach. This is not the end of the world, and if you disagree with me, that's fine. See me in court, just sign the ticket. If you don't sign the ticket, you're gonna make me take you to jail.
I don't want to do that. If you have that ability to talk to people, you're going to be this much safer and your service to the public is going to be way better. So anyway, um, it's okay if we take like three minutes of questions and then I'll, I'll call it. Yeah. For uh, military vets, do you buy back their time? They don't buy back time, but what uh, military vets are given is preference points in the selection process. So let's say you got like a 65 out of 100 on your oral interview. I think vets get, e it's either a 30 or 40 bump point average now. So the fact that you're a vet would bump you to 90 or 95, you know, depending on what you got. Sometimes if, like, let's say you get an 80, it'll put you at 120, which means I got first pick of everyone that was not a vet. I, I'm not a vet. There were two guys in my, in my academy that were vets. They got to pick parks before me. And that's because they got these super scores because of their veteran preference points. So a lot of guys in our department are vets. Yeah. Um, how does choosing, do you choose where you, where you your jurisdiction? Is what you, the ranking of your class from the academy, like where you were? Yeah, so actually that's, that's a, a great question. Um, your initial park that you choose is based off of your rankings in your oral interview, not by your performance in the academy. I know that's a, a little weird and it's not how most departments work, but for whatever reason, that's how ours does. When you sign up for a park, let's say you were at the bottom of the list, you're number 23 and you got a park that you really didn't want, like Red Rock out in the middle of the desert, right? You have to spend at least one year at your starting park and at least two years in the district that your park is in. The state is divided up into, I think we're at like 13 or 14 districts now. So this is the Channel Coast District. It encompasses all of Santa Barbara and all of Ventura County. So districts are broken, or districts are broken down into sectors and then you usually work in a sector. So for example, I started out at Carpinteria. Um, I was there actually for less than a year. I got really lucky and I jumped right into the Santa Barbara sector up here with these parks. But since I am over my two-year time, if I wanted to transfer to anywhere in the state, when they fly the positions, which they do on a weekly basis, I could do it just like that. And one of the coolest things, which I know we're low on time, but it's one of the best parts of the job that I got to tell you guys about, state housing. Um, if you are a ranger or a maintenance worker, you have the opportunity for state housing, meaning you get to live in your parks. I live in the park and my rent is $300 a month. And I have a view of the entire Santa Barbara channel. And the downside to it is I get called out of my house sometimes at 3 a.m. to go deal with something. And sometimes twice a night, depends. So that's the other side of it. That's why I have reduced rent so that I can apply public service when no one else is there too, so. Any other question? I'll take one more question before I wrap up. For uh, getting summer jobs, what kind of duties would you uh, expect for uh, a rookie? And also, um, what locations are available as far as the five uh, job titles that we open? So um, everyone starts in a kiosk, which is what you'll do every shift, which is registering people, answering questions, answering the phone, all that sort of stuff. Um, you either get to work at El Capitan, Refugio, or Gaviota. Uh, people who are commuting from this end, I generally have work at El Cap and Refugio. People coming from Lompoc and Santa Maria and all that area, I generally have them work Gaviota since it's a little closer. But you can't, you'll work all three parks. You know, so it's whatever the, whatever we need. So, well thanks guys, thanks for coming. I got a lot of brochures up here if you want to take them, including some specially involved with careers as a state park ranger or lifeguard.